Hello and welcome, I'm Ben Gartland from Digi International. Today's demo is going to be the initial setup of a Digitransport WR router. We'll configure an Ethernet interface, the cellular WAN interface, we'll change the default login credentials and review and enable the firewall. This demo is relevant to all Transport WR routers. We're using TerraTerm in this demo, uh, as this works quite well with our transport routers. The settings to configure are speed 115200, 8 non 1 with no flow control. The first command we'll be entering is AT, which just is a good command to prove that serial port is working through to the route correctly. Then we type in ID, which shows us hardware and software information. So here you can see it's a WR44, and the software build is 6103. We'll scroll back down and then we'll have a quick look at the routing table with the command root print. Now here you can see that the default IP address is still on the Ethernet 0 interface 192.168.1.1. If we do eth0 status we can see there that the interface is active and connected. Um, but because the LAN here is not using the, the same subnet as the router default, we're going to set up the DHCP client on Ethernet 0 um, and then check the interface again. And we can see here it's obtained an IP address using DHCP. The new IP address is 192.168.049 with a 24 bit mask. We'll have a look at the routing table again. And you can see there the IP address is shown. Ethernet 0 is up on the new subnet. So now we'll switch to the web browser and continue with the web-based configuration. We'll pop in the IP address. We'll skip the getting started wizard. And we'll just log in with the default username and password. The username is a username, the password is password. And we'll come to the, the basic welcome screen. We can see here the, the model, the part number, and the firmware version, so similar information to what we saw in the CLI. To start with the configuration, we're going to go to Network, Interfaces, Mobile, and in here we're going to go to Mobile Settings, and in here we're going to put in the APN to use. Now this differs depending on the service provider in use, but the one I'm going to be using is mobile.o2.co.uk, as the service provider is O2. If your SIM has a PIN enabled, you can enter and confirm the PIN in these two boxes. If the APN you're using requires a username and password, you can enter that in these boxes shown here. The APN we're using does not need a username and password, so we'll leave these fields blank. Click the Apply button to apply the settings. We'll go into the Advanced section, and in here you can see there's the SIM PUC and the Confirm PUC. If the SIM has been locked due to the PIN being entered too many times incorrectly, you can unlock the SIM using the PUC field here. Once we're happy with the configuration, we can click on Save Configuration and click on the Save button at the top. It only takes a moment to save the configuration to Flash. So now we'll go into the Management and Network Status, Interfaces, mobile menu and we'll have a look here and confirm that the mobile WAN interface has come up correctly. So we can see there the signal strength is good, minus 71 dBm. The IP address there that's been obtained from the service provider along with DNS servers. As we scroll down we can see that the signal strength again is shown as minus 71 and the radio technology in use is LTE. We've got a Sierra wireless module in here, which is the MC7710, and here you can see the ICC ID of the SIM that's in the router. The GPRS um, attachment status actually refers to all radio network types, so uh, GPRS, 3G, and LTE. So you can see there that the radio module is attached to the network, and it's registered on the mobile network, and also connected to the cell ID. Um, which is shown with the CI prefix. So that's useful for troubleshooting as it allows you to check which cell ID the radio module is connected to on the base station. 
we'll continue to scroll down and now go into the IP routing table. Uh, so here we can see the default routes are shown and the only default route we have is via PPP1 which is up. So that's the mobile or cellular WAN interface that we've just configured. Next we'll go into security and do another important task which is changing the default username and password. If you don't do this and the router has a public IP address then anybody that knows the default username and password will be able to access your router. So type in a secure username, something that only you know and also a secure password. Clicking on the access level where it says super you will see the other access levels available that you can apply to different users. This is an administrative user level so different users can have a different level of access on this router. To test the username and password you have just configured, don't log out of the router on this tab in case you've made a typo and you don't realize it. Open up a new tab, pop in the IP address and enter the username and password that you have just configured. Then if anything goes wrong it allows you to flick back to the other tab and reconfigure the username and password again and retry. If the service provider you're using on this router allocates a public routable IP address to the WAN interface then I also recommend you configure the firewall. This is done through configuration security firewall and in here you can see the default firewall rule set which is pre-configured on every transport WR router. The lines that you see prefixed with a hash are a comment. The first rule allows FTP traffic outbound from the LAN through to the WAN, but it also enables the router to keep a track of the data ports that are in use and open those dynamically. The next rule down allows all other outbound traffic to exit the WAN interface. This could be traffic generated by the router itself or traffic being routed from the LAN side interfaces out through the WAN interface. The next few rules allow for the setup of an IPsec VPN and then once the VPN is up it allows traffic over that VPN. For management of the router only secure management protocols are allowed so here we allow SSH and SFTP and if you prefer a web based configuration HTTPS. And finally the last rule will block or discard all of the packets. Anything that is blocked by this rule will create an entry in the firewall log with a brief description of why that packet was discarded. To activate the firewall on the WAN interface we need to scroll down further to where we see the PPP1 interface, pop a check mark in the box and click apply. As soon as you click apply the firewall is active. This part of the configuration is complete, so let's click on the link that's going to take us through to the save option and again we'll click on save at the top. Now we'll return to the firewall, so that's security firewall, and on the left here you can see the hit counter and currently they are all zero. So let's go through to execute a command and we'll just send uh, three pings through to Google's DNS server 8.8.8.8 and you can see there that we get three replies. We'll return back to the firewall and you can see now the hit counter has six hits for that rule so that's three outbound and three inbound. If we were to look at a packet trace we would see an ICMP echo request out and an ICMP echo reply coming back and we'd see that three times. Now remember at the start we set up the router with a DHCP obtained IP address on its Ethernet interface. This is probably not what you want for a router on your network. You probably want it to have a static or fixed IP address on its Ethernet interface. Currently it's using uh, 192.168.0.49 but we're going to change that. So the first thing we need to do ideally before we change the IP address is set up a DHCP server that's going to allow the router to assign IP addresses from that new range. So we'll start off with um, a pool at 192.168.0.20 
and we'll end the pool at 192.168.0.59. This should give us enough addresses for our small LAN. The gateway and DNS server need to be set to the IP address that we're going to configure on the router's Ethernet interface. So we'll use 192.168.0.250. We'll change the lease duration to one day because we don't know how often devices are going to be connecting and disconnecting from the network and we'll also enable duplicate address detection just in case there is anything on the LAN that has an IP address within that range already. Now the DHCP server is configured we'll click apply and remember this IP address 192.168.0.250 that's what we're going to apply on the Ethernet Zero interface so we scroll back up, make sure the dot is next to use the following settings, pop in the IP address 192.168.0.250, give it an optional description and click apply. Note that as soon as you click apply the configuration is active and the router will be on its new IP address. So we enter that in the address bar at the top and log in. And finally, we need to make one more save to the configuration to ensure the changes we made to the DHCP server and Ethernet configuration are saved to the router startup configuration.